but feel free to chat. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be waiting a couple minutes before we start. In the meantime, me and my colleague Martha are going to be promoting people from attendees to panelists so that you can turn your cameras on and participate in the Q&A session of the lecture. Thank you. Will just be another couple of minutes before we start. Thank you. Okay, I think we can get started. So it is my pleasure to introduce everybody to Matthias Jacob Becker. Matthias is a long friend of ISGAP, and he's also, let me pull up your bio, the lead, the project lead of the Decoding Antisemitism Project at the Technical University of Berlin. And he's gonna be talking about some of the internet data that's come out since the October 7 massacre. So Matthias, I will pass it on to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much um, for this introduction and also for inviting me uh, to your ESCAP series. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here, especially in uh, these times when we are witnessing this kind of unleashing of antisemitism. So I believe before I get to the uh, findings regarding October 7th, it is not ne necessary to have a fundamental understanding or basic understanding of the research design of the decoding antisemitism project. So I would briefly introduce that and then present present the examples uh, that that I had in mind in order to exemplify how antisemitism online looks like, how it changed um, with and after the, the discourse event of uh, October 7th, the massacre. Just for your information, I was tested positive uh, the other day, so I hope my presentation and role in the discussion won't be affected by this. Uh, so sorry for the bad news, but I will give my my best. <clears throat> okay, so the 7th of October and the subsequent events were a profound moment of shock, obviously. And this sentiment re resonated deeply with researchers in the field of um, social media studies, like I am, who have been engaged in research of antisemitism online for years. And what we observed online and continue to capture represents a significant turning point, a point that definitely needs articulation, especially at, the, at a time when news outlets, understandably, still prioritize events in the offline world of the Middle East and worldwide. But of course, it is crucial not to overlook the online realm as the boundaries between online and offline have, have become increasingly blurred. And also is it, it is clear that much of the international anti-Semitic hatred we re recognize these days has been cultivated in online discourse for years. And now with the trigger of October 7th, it is experiencing an unprecedented escalation regarding its frequency, but also the way it is expressed. Um, without social media and the communication conditions online, such as anonymity, the mutual reinforcement of web users, the emotionalized acceleration of online debates, all that, plus the sheer omnipresence of disinformation, hate speech, and conspiracy theories, events like let's go a few years back, the shootings in Pittsburgh and Poway, as well as those in Paris, in Halle, Germany, in London, would have been scarcely possible 
in the realm of online communication, you have copycat effects, a depiction of the perpetrators as heroes, and the slow but constant normalization of hateful and exclusionary ideas. And the same with the current climate at demonstration, uh, demonstrations uh, and on UK and US campuses. Therefore, language and communication in general not only serves a representational function, but also has an impact on our thinking, our feeling, our actions. Just think of the historical significance of language and the media in the perpetuation of Jew hate within Europe over centuries, with Nazi Germany as its climax. Here it was language, propaganda, imagery that were the discursive carriers of those ideas. So why there is nothing new about it, uh, the advent of social media introduced a new interplay. On the one hand, you had antisemitism existing throughout history and persisting in collective memory, escalating in certain phases. Then all these ideas about Jews got incorporated into social media discourse where due to the aggregate state of communication, these ideas get intensified and can reach societal segments that were previously either unreceptive or ignorant of these anti-Semitic tropes. And this in turn reverberates back into the offline world. So you can see kind of a vicious cycle whose worrying consequences uh, constantly increase. The web is not only, I would say, a catalyst when you also think of the way the algorithms work, how they actually um, uh, allow particularly hate speech to, to, to flourish, to, to be shared. But even as a super individual creator of an anti-Semitism that is so, so socially acceptable, uh, something that could not exist beforehand uh, in that way. Therefore, when it comes to society developments on national, but also on continental or even global scales, the analysis of web discourse is unavoidable and absolutely essential. There's no way around it. And the political arena needed ages to understand this. Social media studies even hold significant advantages over conventional opinion research from previous decades. Um, um, for it's conducted, for instance, through surveys or polls, uh, which could only provide extremely limited snapshot, snapshots of uh, public opinion, let alone capture latent attitudes. So my focus now shifts towards the inverse direction, viewing language not just as an instrument or a catalyst for attitudes and actions, but as a gateway to the mind, for which one can reconstruct sometimes even unconscious thought patterns, which is what I as a cognitive linguist aim to do. And if applied correctly, so I'm talking about social media studies who are able to track down those patterns online, if applied correctly, you could even to some extent anticipate uh, how web discourse and with it anti-Semitism evolves in the, close, in the close future. However, measuring online uh, anti-Semitism um, uh, is easier said than done with challenges arising at multiple levels. On the one hand, of course, you have the phenomenon itself, the hate ideology of antisemitism, metaphorically described as the chameleon due to its highly adaptable shape-shifting nature, existing for more than 2000 years, adapting itself and therefore present uh, or prevalent in, in all society, political and cultural milieus. Um, and during this long period, different concepts have emerged as building blocks of this hate ideology, uh, like stereotypes, analogies, also self-positionings in forms of affirmation of anti-Semitism, Holocaust distortion, etc. The second challenge would, of course, be the, uh, the form with which these concepts are communicated uh, or reproduced. So the packaging, let's say, um, when it comes to communication and anti-Semitism, we must also consider the diachronic dimension to understand anti-Semitism today so synchronically. Um, so anti-Semitism is not always communicated one-to-one. -one. There are historical reasons for this. There's a, there was a, a global awareness of, of, of anti-Semitism, or let's say an awareness in the West uh, with um, the Holocaust as a rupture in civilization, uh, creating a different awareness of anti-Semitism and the dangers of linguistic or verbal violence, not only in Germany, but internationally. 
And in German antisemitism research, that whole development is described as, um, uh, or the impact of this of this process of becoming aware of antisemitism is described as communication latency, which means that the antisemitic concepts that were kind of a cultural normal over the previous centuries um, kind of migrated to private, to the private discourse. People couldn't say anymore that Jews control the world or are greedy, but they uh, like publicly, but they just communicated it in private domains. Or if they continue communicating in the same way, the pattern changed. And that's what I'm interested in, uh, how explicit reproductions of stereotypes change, uh, kind of mutate into their implicit forms. And I will talk about this in a second. And of course, the third uh, section or the challenge would be the communication space itself, the interactive web with its incredibly diverse communication architecture, online milieus, you have echo chambers, all these forms that actually make it very, very difficult to measure this kind of development, these trends uh, that uh, accompany antisemitism. You have a diversity and density of data. And of course you have bottom-up processes, not any more top-down processes as we know it from conventional media, from discourse as it occurred uh, in, in history, but a, um, uh, an, an online discourse, which is very often shaped, um, diversified and radicalized by uh, anonymous web users. So this differentiation is extremely crucial, explicit versus implicit antisemitism. And that's, I, I just re repeat this because it's crucial also for the, the, the slides I will show in a second. Uh, explicit antisemitism, just to be on the same page, there you have a one-to-one -one relationship between the idea or the concept the mental concept and the applied language in order to communicate that. And you would have explicit antisemitism in forms of um, like with, um, with, with slurs, for instance, but also direct reproductions of stereotypes, analogies, uh, the patterns I mentioned before. Implicit antisemitism in contrast to that would mean that there are semantic gaps. There's sometimes detour communication. Uh, you don't have that kind of one-to-one -one relationship. You need different sources, uh, different background knowledge in order to, to, to close these gaps. And uh, these sources would be language knowledge, context knowledge, or work knowledge. It's historical knowledge for ex extrapolating the hidden meaning. Uh, to give you a brief, a brief uh, uh, understanding of that, this is just a small overview, a really a, a tiny part of the, uh, the forms of implicit, uh, anti-Semitic hate speech that we could find online. Um, a lot of examples, I admit that, but it, you, you get a pretty good understanding of how you can uh, structure the online discourse uh, following certain suggestions from uh, pragma linguistics, discourse studies, etc. So the first point would, of course, be semiotic markers, multimodal units where imagery is always involved or uh, typographic properties you all probably know or have heard about the three parentheses, um, Israel put in quotation marks, which would be an implicit way to question its, its uh, legitim uh, le le legitimacy. Uh, the usage of icons, uh, GIFs, memes, um, the paraglider icon is um, becoming um, very prominent in the discourses we are looking at. Uh, another level would be puns, where the surface of the word has changed and uh, where the hidden meaning is just communicated based on these changes. So people can uh, use a pun in order to express the idea that the Holocaust is a hoax by just referring to Spielberg's movie in Schwindler's List. And just based on small changes on the surface of the word, the idea that uh, the Holocaust is a hoax is communi communicated implicitly. And then of course you see a whole range of examples where Israel as a word is involved um, again, questioning its right to exist or alleging that Israel has been a Nazi state, et cetera, et cetera. But the allusions, the third group, um, it is a little bit more tricky because there the words remain intact, but they are put into a context that in the first place might, you know, might be irritating. Uh, for instance, um, just getting directly to Nazi comparisons. If someone says, 
there's a final solution uh, of the Palestinian question. Um, people need to know historical knowledge. They need to know about Nazi propaganda in order to close the gaps. What is actually meant here, which is Israel is the new Nazi state. Or if you go back to the previous paragraph, uh, this sentence, someone should give Soros a shower, or the Austrian artist was right. In both cases, an allusion saying or uh, leading to the conclusion that um, uh, Nazi atro atrocities were actually justified and with regard to Soros and in a, a coded death wish using an allusion to the gas chambers. So it would take ages to go through through all the levels we could find um, online. I just want to give you a taste of how this kind of work looks like and what we need to take into account in order to have a proper understanding of how anti-Semitism articulates itself. Um, and so this is just the language. This is just the verbal level. Uh, of course, when we talk about web communication, imagery, multimodality is extremely crucial. You probably all heard of the, the uh, Happy Merchant meme um, which is uh, by far the most popular anti-Semitic meme among white supremacists, but not only uh, uh, not only them. And here you can see the compatibility, the adaptability of of this meme in various contexts. With automatic classification, you would have a chance to to find that um, find those forms pretty easy easily because the, the uh, combination of, of face and, and hands, et cetera, is more or less the same all the time, but it just gives you an understanding of whatever happens in the present or in the recent past, this kind of understanding of, you know, some deceitful um, actions in the background can always be applied. And um, I already mentioned the, the phenomenon of paragliders after October 7th. Here you can see various examples how they circulated and not only on um, uh, Islamist platforms, of course, like probably the most uh, prominent um, image that, that you all saw is from is shared by Black Lives Matter in Chicago on the left hand side. So the usage of such image, such imagery or multimodal units, as soon as words are also involved, in online communication cannot mean anything else than the approval and celebration of the massacre of October 7th. Um, since I already mentioned the term of uh, multimodality, I wanna give you some more examples where you actually see how important it is to look into the combination of a relationship between words and images. And here you see a couple of examples where for instance, in the first uh, slide, um, the idea of a taboo of criticizing Israel is communicated, or uh, there's a visual allusion to the great white shark uh, using also Jewish, alleged Jewish physiognomy and greed. Um, and of course, Holocaust denial. And uh, right now we see all sorts of um, projections onto the Jewish state, starting with child murder, genocide, of course, is a, is a term that comes up on a, on a, well, on a daily basis. Uh, Nazi comparisons, um, and of course, again, uh, playing the anti-Semitism card uh, on the top right, for instance, that is the taboo of criticizing Israel and uh, below it, the exploitation of the US by um, a Jewish or Israeli lobby. So I've been working in that field for roughly 10 years now. And uh, the majority of comments I've analyzed online by a text or image uh, are of implicit nature in various regards. And this of course leads to the, uh, this leads, sorry, this leads to the conclusion or to the proverbial tip uh, of uh, the iceberg idiom, a visual metaphor by which I would like to suggest that we still cannot yet recognize the true extent of anti-Semitism online. So we need far more research despite the fact that the web is the most important platform for political debate. Uh, the real dimension of anti-Semitism is still uh, unknown until today, or we just have a proper understanding of the tip of the iceberg. And this actually led to the idea of um, decoding anti-Semitism as my research project, which started in summer 2020. It will be running till uh, May 
2024. Uh, so a couple of months uh, are left and it's funded by the Alfred Landecker Foundation based at TU Berlin. Uh, Daphne already mentioned it. And here we have a range of scholars coming together from linguistics, but also media studies, philosophy, history, anti-Semitism studies, obviously, that actually work together, um, bringing in a, like, a like a comprehensive understanding of, of Jew hatred, how it occurred in the past, how it occurs today, and trying to, to understand if it occurs today, in what form does it, does it occur? And of course, you would always need to have um, an in-depth approach, uh, a qualitative approach to actually understand the full dimension of it. What we are interested in is not so much uh, the anti-Semitism of the old right or um, uh, white supremacy platforms, but mainstream society. Because we, we would say, also when you look at the current escalation and the consequences worldwide, Anti-Semitism on campuses, anti-Semitism coming from the left, in in among artists, uh, it is actually the mainstream, the the politically mod moderate discourse, that uh, is a challenge in itself. Because as soon as anti-Semitism, the way I presented it uh, two minutes ago, in implicit ways, is communicated there, um, there are very often there's a lack of sanctioning that. In contrast to, for instance, anti-Semitic tropes uttered by a neo-Nazi, of course. So the, the mainstream, the uh, elaborate, implicit forms of anti-Semitism, in our understanding, partic particularly for me as a linguist, uh, play a crucial part um, for the internationalization of, of, of anti-Semitism in various um, political contexts. So um, that's more or less the focus of the project. We have uh, a whole range of disciplines, uh, as I mentioned before, and we start with a qualitative content analysis uh, using a tool called MaxQDA. And what I mentioned before, and the conceptual level, the stereotypes, analogies, the whole arsenal, as I call it, regarding antisemitism is taken into account how it occurred over the last 2000 years. And it is uh, annotated or labeled together with the package, the, the words, the augmentation, the visual material that is uh, applied in order uh, to uh, communicate those ideas in a persuasive fashion. And this is a screenshot of the tool we, we've been using since summer 2020. You see on the right-hand side uh, an extract of a, uh, of a comment section on the left-hand side, you see the code system, the categorical system we use. It's roughly consisting of 250 codes or categories, and we always double code uh, the, 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 the phenomena in order to see over time um, if there's a change in the way how people express ideas um, um, when it comes to Israel, when it comes to Jewish communities in London, whatever it is, if, for instance, people start with very implicit forms and over time there's a normalization of that trope so that people actually start using not any more rhetorical questions, but puns or even explicit forms. And um, in order to just a brief footnote, in order to uh, not just present it in the context of talks and presentations and workshops, but actually give that also to fellow scholars and civil society, we decided to translate our knowledge and uh, the way we <clears throat> deal with online hate and all its diversity into an open access book, which will be um, accessible in coming coming February as an open access document. So published with Pelgrave Macmillan and in each, um, there, there are roughly 45 chapters dedicated, each dedicated to one concept. And you will have lots of examples per phenomenon, per concept that will help you understand uh, what the difference is between, um, again, a direct reproduction of the stereotype of greed versus its indirect equivalence. And um, so it's rough, roughly 350 pages in English with a lot of data sets. And I think it will help shed some light uh, on these into these gray areas that we are confronted with um, in, our, in our work. Um, the qualitative analysis is just the first step. There are three steps in the project. Just to mention it briefly, what we try to do with the annotated data is not just to present uh, the world where we stand at the moment regarding mainstream antisemitism, 
in uh, the countries of interest. Sorry, I didn't mention that the three countries we are looking at are the UK, Germany, and France. We are about to expand further, also take into account Spain and Italy and other countries, uh, but I will talk about this in a second. But it is actually used, the annotated data um, are used in order to train classifiers, large language models, so that they can replicate our decision. And that's what's happening already for uh, one and a half years now. Uh, you can see step two on this, on this scheme, and there's kind of a, um, a feedback loop between the scholars, between uh, our colleagues in the field of data science and us as uh, scholars from the humanities and social sciences, so that these classifiers step-by-step step get better and better and have more and more accurate results. And then, of course, this will lead to bigger, um, wider statistical analysis of huge amounts of data sets based on the results from step one and step two. In order to give people regular updates, we publish discourse reports every six months. And, um, and, and what, what we did, for instance, in the second report, we were looking into the escalation phase in May, 2021. You can see, you know, I sometimes present also a QR code on the side. Sorry, I didn't mention that at the beginning. When you just scan this, you will always, you will be led to directly to uh, the publication um that will illuminate a little bit further what i what i mean uh with this uh with these brief insights um and here you can see based on a qualitative analysis of 4500 comments at that time on facebook you can see the proportions between the three countries and the uk uk has uh more anti-semitism than france and germany together and there are various reasons for that. And we elaborate on that in the discourse report number two that you can download. And um, the most prominent examples where our uh, concepts, anti-Semitic concepts, where Israel representing the fundamental global evil and, of course, historical demonizing analogies, Israel is a Nazi state, Israel is an apartheid state. So this is not very uncommon. Okay, the numbers are surprising with regard to the UK particularly. Again, there are reasons for that. But what is really a big change, what was really a challenge for us and a kind of a turning point was the, the examination of the online responses in October, 2023. When you look at this slide, and now I open the next one, you will see that the numbers are quite different. Uh, they're quite really going in, 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 in different directions. Um, and again, there are um, uh, reasons for that. First of all, it needs to be highlighted that there was a significant jump in the number of anti-Semitic com comments posted uh, on YouTube and uh, Facebook. So the, the corpus is also bigger, but still, statistically speaking, we had lots of comment sections, particularly in the UK, but also in France, where the amount of anti-Semitism doubled or even tripled. And um, the strike, a striking aspect in all of this is that it was not the news stories about the retaliations coming from the IDF that led to this amount of anti-Semitism. As soon as we looked into this, we could see a whole range of typical anti-Semitic, anti-Israel projections, like the analogies I mentioned before. And, but no, in this case, it was actually the media coverage directly related to the footage from Hamas. And uh, those comment sections actually led to this kind of peak of anti-Semitism. And that's pretty interesting. Uh, for Benny Morris wrote a fascinating piece a couple of weeks ago on the aspect of Jewish weakness and defenselessness in the history of anti-Semitism in the European past. And this uh, and that this kind of defenselessness, when we think of pogroms, anti-Semitic pogroms in Eastern Europe, that it very often also led like covered by the media, that it also led to anti-Semitic hate in other countries, in other regions of Europe. But this didn't really come up, like what I what I can say about social media. It didn't, there was no clear correlation. So far, it was mainly um, those statements when you actually think of Israel being presented as, you know, Jews presented as white oppressors. When this stood in the fore, anti-Semitic projections were all over the place. But this now seems to change, or it has changed with regard to October 7th. And therefore, we call it a turning point 
something that we that I have never seen the decoding anti-Semitism project never saw and um, and beyond affirmation of the Hamas attacks there were of course also these concepts coming up that we know from last years like the denial of Israel's right to exist attributing the sole guilt in the conflict to Israel for the entire history of the conflict describing Israel as a terrorist state conspiracy theories a whole repertoire just to give you uh, a few examples um, um, like an affirmation of violence and uh, suggested destruction of Israel. They deserve 60 years of this, not only a day, then we will have peace, perhaps. Of course, affirmation is very often also uttered straightforward, just with Allah Akbar or Free Palestine, which below the line of a YouTube clip about how what happened at the Nova Festival can only be understood as an affirmation of or celebration of that kind of violence. Of course, there are also statements like, good job, Palestine, go on, lads, so happy to see justice finally. There's a lot of schadenfreude uh, when it comes to uh, the festival community, peaceful community, you must treat like this everywhere. And you can see lots of examples where you can see that it's not about Israelis only, it's about Jews in general, like this wordplay that you can see here, or again, the allusion I mentioned before, and the, the allusion to the Austrian painter. And um, in each uh, comment section I've been analyzing, there is, of course, the, October 7th is depicted as a starting point for something that will be brought to the whole, to the whole West. And um, other examples are, of course, uh, uh, examples of, of um, uh, gloating and misogyny. There are lots of examples related to uh, female victims. That's the price paid for being cute, for instance, was something that came up on a regular basis. They had a good time with her, it seems like. Here, the example I just presented is a reference, again, to denial of Israel's right to exist. It's always the whole land. Um, the third intifada is requested full independence this time and soul guilt. So I could go on. There are just many examples, but you can just see how a, a handful of ideas or concept are, concepts are expressed by various linguistic, sometimes visual means. And uh, it's, it's full of, like, there's a lot of lack of empathy, to say the least. Again, gloating schadenfreude is all over the place. Um, and um, always getting back to ideas that Israel actually deserves it, that Israel is actually the, the new Nazi state. Israelis are presented as, um, as, uh, as Nazis, as Germans, and actually presented themselves as Jews as soon as, uh, as the Second World War ended, like in this example. Or a very interesting example here, the second one, Israel is doing to Palestinians what they claim Hitler did to them. So this is a Nazi Nazi analogy, obviously, but at the same time, based on the term, based on on the word claim, it also uh, denies uh, the existence of a Shoah, which is you know just two examples, two concepts presented in one example. So I find this um, pretty interesting, and of course references to nine eleven continuously, and that the Jews were behind it, they were dancing. And then you see the people from the Nova Festival, which is kind of an, yeah, which is kind of a, which triggers memories of the old conspiracy theory. What we do right now is look more and more into Instagram. This is work in progress. So far, you can see the most prominent uh, concepts that we could identify. It really depends on the focus of the Instagram post. And of course, if it's pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, um, there are lots of different directions the, the threat can, can, can follow. And um, in the close future, we will look also into uh, TikTok and bring all this together in our last sixth report, which is due, which is due mid of February, which will be presented also in Berlin, London, and in, in Paris in, um, in events uh, end of February, where you, on the one hand, you have a long-term analysis with regard to the current escalation, uh, again, throughout various platforms. Then, of course, a contrastive analysis about these 
similarities, but also discrepancies between May 2021 and today. How did the discourse about Israel change? And uh, what does that say about the future of anti-Israel rhetoric? Um, we will also add more countries. Um, there will be a contrastive analysis about the immediate reactions to October 7th uh, in, in five and maybe even six other language communities. And apart, like, apart from uh, the, the examination of everything that is related to October 7th, we will also have a range of case studies about Elon Musk. You remember his statements about George Soros a couple of months ago, the ADL issue, uh, and also his statement, when was it last week? Uh, this will also be compared as a second case study that will be presented. Then since it's the last discourse report in our pilot phase, um, time flies, we will also give uh, like a bird's eye view of how the project went in the last 3.5 years. We will summarize the results of our workshop series that took place a few weeks ago. And uh, we, of course, will tell you how the large language models um, uh, work at the moment. And um, where are the, you know, what are the differences? What are the um, advantages if you compare it to Google's perspective API, for instance? So this is just in a nutshell. I'm sorry that it was kind of very, uh, <laughs> very brief and i guess there are lots of questions that come up for for all these different uh, sections um but so that you have an understanding where the current phase of our um, case studies is heading and um, what we try to to understand like as i said the pilot phase will end um the pilot phase will end uh in april next year what we would love to do uh this is still in the clouds um, but it looks rather probable that we will get the funding. We will expand, we will extend the scope. We will take into account also the US and Canada. We will look into the transatlantic dimension or dynamics between Europe and North America. We will of course try to, or we will uh, improve uh, the models with regard to various languages, not only English. And uh, we'll also take into account multimodality so that these models are actually able also to detect imagery, text image relations. Um, my goal for the next phase would be as soon, like as, for instance, when we are confronted with an escalation phase like the current one, uh, that we can use these models, these tools in order to track down in real time how the discourse changes in on different platforms, which is also a security issue, of course. and. Um, to actually find more reliable, accurate numbers with all the implications for offline communities, et cetera. Um, but this is something, of course, this uh, which needs to be pursued in the future. Okay. Uh, if you find if you find that interesting, please visit our website <laughs> and have a look at our uh, at our publications and maybe also uh, subscribe to our newsletter. We would appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthias. That was really fascinating, as usual. Really pertinent right now. If anybody would like to ask him a question in person, please raise your virtual hand and I can unmute you and bring you into the, the chat. But in the meantime, we do have some written questions. So our first question is by... Oh, I'll let you... Oh, it... I think you, you had a connection problem right now. I couldn't hear you. Do you mean the, of the question of your anonymous attendee? Mar no, I sorry, I brought Marlene in. If I'm oh, breaking sorry. out, Martha, feel free to step in. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I didn't know it was my turn. <laughs> Hi, Matthias. How are you? <laughs> Hi. Long time no see. <laughs> Long time no see. Um, and hi, Daphne. I, I just had a, a, a question. Um, so I thought it was interesting that that um, a lot of the reaction were due to media and not to Israel's um, actions. And so um, I was wondering um, uh, what your thoughts are on some of the media's um, portrayal of what happened on October 7th and, and um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> I can get, I can ask, I have like 15 questions related to that, but I'll just leave it there. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, uh, it's. Uh, I have to admit, it's not really surprising, given what we saw also in previous years or even decades. Um, it is just an accumulation of everything um, people knew already about, for instance, the BBC. Um, we, you know, with our studies, we don't we don't focus so much on like really the coverage. We take that, of course, as a trigger for uh, online discourse. Uh, for like our, our preliminary study that was published four weeks ago, we also refer to the whole scandal with the hospital and, you know, with a rocket and who was it actually? And uh, it's, 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 yeah, it's, 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 it's a scandal, right? It's a, it's, it's outrageous. And um, I really don't know. I mean, for instance, in Germany, there were lots of attempts to to deal with that. There were lots of media in, in the last 10, 15 years who also shared caricatures that were highly problematic. Uh, but also the big problem is the structuring of information, like what we see right now, that uh, very often just the media represent everything without any critical thought on it of what the spokespeople from, from Hamas uh, are, are telling the world. And, uh, or, you know, who is the active part? Who actually started this? What's actually what is a reaction? What is what is action? What is reaction in in, in the current in the current um, in the current phase uh, in, in 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 the Gaza Strip? And it's uh, it's something not really uh, not really surprising. I find it at least uh, positive that to some extent the BBC tried to uh, change the perspective here and there and uh, to apologize for certain parts, but you know how it is. Uh, you know, uh, a media outlet apologizes a few weeks later, but the problem is already out there. You have uh, a, an authority that you can just refer to, which is also, you know, something what this uh, Hamas spokesperson said the, the other day, interviewed by Sky Australia, I think, referring to this article uh, in Haaretz, that kind of said that uh, it was Israeli helicopters who shot at uh, the festival goers. And it's it's just circulating like, like um, crazy. I would say uh, the media still, and we already had that in previous years. We even had that uh, during the so-called Arab Spring. That there's definitely also a movement that um, standard media are not so much in the center of attention anymore. I mean, it's still the case, but I think we should just take that danger, that threat of mis of disinformation and uh, yeah, disinformation. Let's call it like this, um, uh, and and compare it also to the stuff influencers share online. And this is also a big a big problem. And I think you know it's we just need to be uh, clear and and certain of how we address that. In a way that um, that we can reach out to the bystanders and convince them of, of what what really happened. Sorry, it was a uh, not a very concrete answer, but it's it's a big topic. Thanks, Matthew. Matthias, I'll, I'll speak to you soon. <laughs> Thank you. So maybe we can now move on to the Q and A. Um, the first one's from anonymous. Has asked, do we know the psychological reason for why any anti group? hate should be so emotionally attractive to so many people. Oh, wow. Well, this is this is um yeah, a, a big question. Uh like the the reason for the success story of 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 antisemitism and uh, there are definitely some theories uh out there uh, but I think a, a very important aspect when we look into the history of antisemitism was its stabilizing factor like the discursive uh discursively speaking, the, the stabilizing factor of applying stereotypes, these kind of this, these concepts or these building blocks, as I call it, um, to, um, to the outgroup and to, 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 to foster and stabilize actually the in-group. So uh, of course, when we look at the, the early history of, 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 of Christianity and how every negative trait, every, every negative idea that the Christian in-group couldn't identify themselves with was actually projected, to use a psychoanalytical term, and I already referred to projections, are projected onto the Jewish outgroup. group um, 
just to get rid of it and to have that kind of stabilizing factor. I think this is something that makes antisemitism very attractive. And given that there is such a diversity of, um, of stereotypes, and again, the adaptability with different political, cultural groups makes it act actually to a device, uh, transforms it into a device that can be applied in any possible situation, as for instance, the um, um, the, uh, the 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 memes are presented true, and and so I would describe it as 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 that when we look into the history of German nationhood, um, the German French War, 19, uh, 1871, uh, anti-Semitism was a, a building factor for nationhood in, in, in Germany. It was not just the external enemies like the French or the Brits. It was, of course, the internal enemy that led to a unification of the, of the German in-group, which was not that, like, it was, it was not a very peaceful coexistence between the different German regions. But this aspect of bringing together a common enemy and to know that this enemy is to some extent due to assimilation, invisible, was something very, very powerful for the creation of a positive national self-image or a stabilized national self-image, especially since uh, the German nation state is pretty young. Uh, at that time was pretty young in comparison to other states in, in, in Europe. So that's what I what I, I could uh, refer to. I, there are a couple of really interesting um, articles about this aspect. Um, also, when we think of the, the birth hour of um, modern capitalism and the uncertainties that are related to this, that are connected to this, for instance, Karin Stöckner at the University of Passau, she wrote a couple of really, really interesting pieces about that. And how, again, the stabilizing idea, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the possibility to explain the world in the most, in the most efficient way, uh, take away all the complexity and just uh, personalize an abstract problem, like for instance, capitalism or you know, a crisis um, or a disease in the Middle Ages. So that's, that's another aspect to it. And this is beautifully laid out in her work. Thank you. Um, Jonathan has asked, how does this, do you think, feed into stopping the spread of online hate? Um, well, this, this is, um, you mean social media studies, I guess. Um, how does this help? Uh, well, I tried to allude to it at the beginning of my talk, and it seems that I wasn't very successful with that. Um, I think um the the main idea if you you know the problem with anti-semitism people say anti-semitism existed for two thousand has existed for two thousand years what can we do it will always be there given this kind of shape-shifting nature the adaptability etc cetera, etc cetera. and i would say yeah that's true but at the same time we could see also when you look into the statistical analysis we've conducted so far or certain uh, a certain immunity in 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 large parts of, of of German society. I would say there was definitely, to some extent, a success story when it comes to addressing Jew hatred in Germany post war post war Germany. The way how re-education took place, the way how people talked about anti-Semitism, not so much about you know as the idea of we as Germans talk now about the Jewish art group, but the, the questions that were raised in school classes changed. Not in all school classes, for sure. Uh, I was definitely not that lucky at my at my time as a student, but um, but there was another way of addressing this uh, the the topic, and I would say that also led to the point that people look that the, the probability that people look at the current escalation in a different way in certain segments of German society um, uh, is connected is, is, is connected to this. So I believe into I believe that education helps. It won't it won't eradicate the problem for sure, but it will mitigate it in a, in a good way. But what we need for all this in order to have powerful tools to address anti-Semitism, not anti-Semitism in Nazi in the Nazi era, or in the Soviet Union, but the way it is communicated today online uh, as the most important platform for, or like way how, where young people get socialized, let's say, 
um, we first of all need to understand what is happening there. And when I remember uh, in the last 10 years, eight years, when I also worked together with teachers, the knowledge of how anti-Semitism occurs online was pretty limited, to say the least. But if you want to address Jew hatred, the way it comes up and uh, the concepts that accompany it, as a, as a multiplier, as a teacher, as a part of civil society, you need to understand these patterns. So I think social media studies can really serve as a first very, very powerful step in order to develop counter strategies and the educational work that still do not exist or not exist in a way that they are implemented nationwide, as an example. Uh, and this is just one opportunity or one option we have as social media scholars. If we have good antennas, good ways to measure the phenomenon and to understand the colors, the patterns of anti-Semitism, this can be used in all forms of intervention, right? It's not only education, it's also in the political arena. It can be used in order to raise awareness among journalists, which is also kind of an educational part. But um, I think before we, we say, or be, before we can do something about this very, very powerful hate ideology, we need to understand how it actually occurs. And uh, and that's, I think, the most important aspect. That's why I said at the beginning of the talk, the pol like political actors, multipliers, they need to understand that, yeah, we need to take that seriously. Not only because online discourse has an effect on Jewish communities, but the, the positive thing about social media is that we can illuminate what's happening in our societies now in a way that could have never happened in the history of the West or humanity. It Because, you know, private discourse was something we didn't have any access to. Now, since everything is moving towards the online realm, this looks different. And as long as this doesn't lead to uh, 19, uh, 1984, um, it can be used in a very, very good way and uh, can help um, like as like different situations to immunize um, future generations when it comes to this kind of exclusion and demonization. Yeah, sorry, long answer. No, thank you, that was great. Um, Stefani has written in the, in the chat, what about explicit anti-Semitic content and implicit communication? She means the use of anti-Semitic tropes that people are not aware of or do not use to address anti-Semitic communication. Is there any way to detect that? Um, well, it's, I mean, what we, what we really try to do, of course, is to, to I mean, we try to focus on implicit communication, right? Uh, and, and with implicit, I really mean the, the, the linguistic term of it. Uh, and we talk about, uh, for instance, unconscious forms, it doesn't really matter because we don't, as, 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 as um, corpus linguists, uh, pragma linguists, uh, we are not interested in the intent behind a statement because very often when we look into a verbal antisemitism, which comes up in all sorts of, in all sorts of situations, it's very often uttered unconsciously. So, but there are ways to measure it. That's also what we try to do with the lexicon, which will be published in February to see what is actually uttered, what are the, you know, as a linguist, I would call it a reference potential, which means the, the words and phrases and argumentation that is actually presented in the web comment. And the inference potential uh, or inference potential would be what kind of associations would you as a person growing up in Britain have with that. For instance, you know, I, I mentioned the term allusion. What does the term um, ghetto, for instance, uh, trigger um, uh, when, when we talk about an Italian web user or a German web user? I mean, there are different associations with that term. I would say in Germany, it's, it's pretty clear that the term ghetto, when we talk about the Gaza Strip, immediately activates the scenario uh, or the interpretation that you, that uh, Israel's the new Nazi state. In other contexts, the word ghetto can mean something else uh, or can associate something uh, different depending on the nation's history and what is prominent in public discourse and, and the collective memory. Um, so yeah, so this 
there we need to tread very carefully. But um, what we what we try to do, of course, is to to get a really proper overview um, of implicitness in all language when it comes to all language communities we are interested in, and and but take into account that there will still be a gray area. Uh, for instance, the, the sentence "Soros is an evil banker." It's not really clear if it really refers to Soros, Soros's Jewish background or uh, his um, checkered history as an investment banker. So there are gray areas that will always remain. Um, but this gray area is much smaller than people might think. And I think pragmalinguistics is a very good way to, to address that topic. Um, Lawrence has um, pointed out some um, of the anti-Semitic incidents uh, in France. I'm not sure that's a question, Lawrence. Feel free to jump in um, if you want to ask on that. But he's also asked, how can I register to your newsletter? That was a reference to... Um, oh, uh, okay. How you can... Well, it's, it's pretty simple. When you just go to the website, uh, just scroll down, and there you can type in your, your email address and then... Uh, then everything is sorted. Uh, it's it's pretty straightforward. Also, if you want to have a look at what we did so far in the news section or publications, you get an overview also of the of the like the, the short version of our guidebook and uh, like the again the tools we use. And you have of course all discourse reports and the preliminary study that I referred to uh, for October seventh uh, can also be downloaded. Uh, you will find it in the news section. So um, yeah, that's, that shouldn't be a problem. And um, I didn't understand the previous question with regard to the anti-Semitic acts in, in France. Yes, there was just a comment. Um, oh, okay. I'm not sure whether it was a question or a comment, but Lawrence pointed okay. out that there's been no new data for almost two weeks now. Um, and uh, yeah, Lawrence, if you want to jump in, feel free. Um, but uh, if not, that may have just been a comment. Oh, yeah. So, Lawrence, I'll allow you to talk. You can. Yeah. You can mute yourself. Feel free. And also, since the education part was uh, uh, was was uh, mentioned, there will be also some events in the close future in, in in Britain. Also, online events. If you are interested in that, you know how to address anti-Semitism in classrooms based on the results from social media studies. Feel free to check out the website. There will be some event probably on yeah prob probably already next week. Uh, we still need to figure it out, um, but yeah. If if you if you want to know how this these two um, um, arenas like research the way we do it and um, and education can be connected, there will be lots of ways to learn about this. Thank you. So Lawrence, feel free. Yes, I'm here, but I can you hear me? Hi. Yeah. Yes. We, 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 you. Hello. Hi, uh, I just I just made a comment about France because you were showing that um, uh, the the anti-Semitic acts were more numerous in UK than France and and Germany together. Yeah, and uh, but mm -hmm. what I what I found out I've, I've been looking every day to the to the I live in Paris I've been uh, checking every day on the anti-Semitic acts in France and until. They, they gave the numbers until no, November 14th. There were 15, 18 acts since 7th of October. And then they stopped giving the numbers because probably they were they were growing too quickly and didn't want maybe to to be too frightening. Um, and comparing to, to 2022, the acts were in one year 436. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it's been quite uh, huge in one and in six weeks, it's been very, very <coughs> big. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, but you have to see one point. This is absolutely true. And uh, it's funny because I was based in Paris until end of October. And uh, I know I know pretty well what you're talking about. But these are statistics about um, anti-Semitic incidents offline, like attacks and and, uh, and Magen David on, on the walls of, of houses and, and Mm-hmm. All that is so. What we do is is we just look at social media researchers. We just look into social media and uh, what we can see there. And okay. even there, uh, you 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 just need to take into account that it's it's absolutely that these these numbers don't tell shouldn't tell anyone that Germany has a smaller problem with anti-Semitism than the UK. That's not what we are saying. It's it's still a small um, portion. Okay of online discourse, because what we do is we always start with a qualitative approach. And even though we have 25 people working in the project, um, which is big for for a research project, you know, sometimes it's uh, usually it's much smaller, but of course we can't take all these developments online into account. So therefore our data sets are limited. They are very often, they're just focusing on mainstream discourse Still, when it comes to these, for instance, the 11,000 comments we looked at uh, in the context of October 7th, they have a value of representativeness. Um, But you can only say something reliable about the overall presence of anti-Semitism when we actually have better classifiers, when we actually have better love language models. But this will take time. So far, Mm -hmm. when you look at the sheer amount of irony or rhetorical questions, or again, these semantic gaps I was referring to. Large language models, they are pretty good in comparison to 2019, but there's a long way to go till they understand how we as human beings express ideas, and particularly uh, a hate ideology like antisemitism. And uh, therefore we don't still don't know properly where we stand at the moment. It's, it's a work in progress, globally speaking, because um, we do make some progress in the field of artificial intelligence, but it's language is just very complex. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thank you. We are running um, out of time, but Excellence has one question, and Jonathan also asked for one quick clarification. Could you mention again the source for that research about taking factors out like capitalism to simplify complex issues? um oh yeah well this is this is um this is a a, a good a, a good question um so there's for instance i mean i can i can definitely share a couple of um, um articles um later on that could be forwarded it's a it's a it's a big topic um uh, I mentioned Karin Stöckner, which is who who wrote a lot about this. There's also a very good introduction by Stefan Griegard. But even when you look at uh, the book Triads uh, of Diaspora, um, uh, which is kind of the Bible of anti-Semitism studies, Bible in this context sounds weird, um, um, in, in, in Britain, uh, there you have a lot of references to this particular topic. Um, so in order to keep it short, since we are running out of time, I would suggest that I just send a couple of really good introductory texts that illuminate this kind of connection, if that's all right. Perfect, yes, thank you. Jonathan will be in touch. You can put your email um, into the chat for the hosts and panelists. Or, yeah, you um, can even see my email. Oh yeah, or oh, like yeah, this, exactly. yeah. Can, or yeah. send directly the, to the Matai and say, that'd be great. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, the one last question to Excellence. I will um, allow you to talk. Um, if you just unmute yourself, then I should be able to hear you. Hello, am I? Hi. Am I? Yeah, audi- I can hear you. Okay. Hi. All right. So my name is Excellence. Um, joining from Cameroon. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thank I thank uh, ISGAP for this opportunity and for this session especially. Now, um, first, we had a plan and still do have that plan for um, 
a first independent regional consultation on anti-Semitism in Africa. And we had uh, designed this for August of next year. And we had quite uh, very progressive uh, conversations with the different partners and stakeholders. Now, I, I bring this up because of this particular title of this discussion today. After the October 7 and the justifiable response of Israel, very many of the partners and other stakeholders and interest parties have either pulled off or developed cold feet or are not just as forthright as they have always been. It leaves me with a lot of questions as a person. Um, the whole world watched 9 11. And any response America took um, as a result of that was justified. There was no question. Now, at the backyard of another country called Israel, just because it is called Israel, you take a response to keep your people safe, to keep your country safe, and very many other consequences are following, even to good initiatives. So um, one question um, that has been bothering my little mind is this. Will the world ever come to the point of judging Israel fairly? And if the answer is no, how will Israel and friends of Israel respond? It has been a worry because even online, the few, the few um, online uh, the channels that we have that we are discussing with, the responses have been very vague, very, um, very unsupportive and very unfair. So will there be any point that the world would come to judge Israel fairly? Okay, thank you. This, 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 these were just my comments and, and perhaps my question or worry. Um, if you have a comment, fine. If you don't, it is okay. So, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, this is a big, um, a big question, but I think I won't be able to respond to it because I don't know. I mean, this is, of course, um, a hope I have. Uh, you can see the the this phenomenon you were describing, the response from um, from different players to the October seventh massacre is of course something you can find on various levels. Um, uh, not only when we talk about the political level, but of course also in the field of uh, like my field, university, uh, what's happening on campuses what's happening with the corporations with Israeli universities. Um, and of course, the art world, which is something I didn't really take seriously for a long time, the anti-Israel narrative in the art world, but already in May, 2021, this changed quickly. And when you look at, for instance, film festivals or some other areas where actually people do present their work, you very often come across uh, the the observation that uh, Israeli artists cannot show their work anymore, that all Israeli movies are taken away, taken out of the program. And um, so it's, it's it's something that you can find in various milieus, um, in various contexts. And it's, yeah, it's heartbreaking. I think uh, in the close future, this is definitely not realistic that this will change in any way. Um, um, it all has to do also with narratives, hegemonic narratives in the media, and of course how institutions like the United Nations react to this. But what we could see how the United Nations reacted to um, to 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 uh, uh, October seventh, and for instance also the obvious uh, misogynistic brutality you could see there is um, as one example is. Uh, it's extremely scary and disappointing. And um, I, well, I don't, I can't really give you an answer. I just hope that over like long time, long term uh, understanding of, of anti Semitism, this can change. But since we 
talk about global phenomena, it is highly improbable that this will change at any point uh, in the close future. Sorry, this is not another very optimistic uh, final statement, but I wouldn't know how to put it differently. Well, thank you so much, Matthias, for that really interesting and informative um, um, seminar. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, our next ones, um, next on, on December 6th, I've put the link um, to register in the chat if anyone is interested. Um, and um, yeah, thank you so much. And um, hope you'll have a good rest of your days wherever you are. Thank you so much. Okay. It was Bye. a pleasure. Bye-bye.